In this episode of Investors and Operators, I sit down with Doug Pick, who is a CPG expert and perhaps has, I don't know, sold what, over 500 million earplugs. <laughs> you, you built one of the largest earplug brands in the US. But what is important for this episode is not only his story and the major milestones building that business from 1992 to Correct. selling the business to Audax backed company in 2018. But the other really important part is what he went through before selling the business to a private equity firm, Audax. And then after selling, what was he doing with the private equity firm, with the PE backed company? And just kind of his advice to the other others out there who were thinking about selling to private equity. So Doug, hopefully that was a, an okay intro. But that I like was to, awesome. That was turn, great. Thank you. Turn, turn it over to you. And if you wouldn't <laughs> mind just kind of giving an intro to um, your background, kind of walking us through the major milestones building the business and some of the key decisions uh, before we get into the selling to private equity. Well, great. Yes, of course. Um, 1992, Jordan, I had this vision that I wanted to bring to the retail space a high quality brand of consumer earplugs. And people are probably thinking, what? Consumer earplugs? That's crazy. But I saw this little niche as a, a just a wonderful, ripe market ready for disruption. And what I saw about it was there was nothing going on. And I'm a guy that learned from my grandfather, sell the sizzle, not the steak. Just make sure you have a good steak. And so what I set out to do was to create this brand and do things from a marketing, promotion, publicity standpoint that nobody else had done. So my journey began just by research. And you know, going back to 1992, there was no internet. There was no way that I could do the type of research that I needed, but I ended up just studying everything I possibly could about the ears, about the marketplace, about my competition. And I was in the music business. So I worked for AM Records for a couple of years after graduating from USC's entrepreneur program. And what I learned in the program was how to do a viability study. So I looked to evaluate the business first to understand, is this even a business? And the more I researched this business, I said to myself, this is really cool because I only had $15,000 in savings at the time and nobody else was going to fund me. So I was able to develop a brand, a package, order inventory, and buy a product in very small quantities and then over time, scale, 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 and scale. So I'll walk you through some of what occurred. First, in um, July of 1992. Sorry, just need to clarify. Yeah. You were not an earplug expert when you started the business with $15,000. <laughs> no, no, not at all. In fact, my background um, going to the music business was I was a photographer of Motley Crue at the age of 13, going out with my friend Stephen Perkins to clubs. Stephen Perkins is now and has famously been the drummer of Jane's Addiction for the last 40 years. And we saw Motley Crue for the first time on Christmas 1981. And then I started taking pictures of the crew. I met Nikki Six, And I just fell in love with this idea of working in the music business. And that was my, that was my sole goal. When I left AM Records, I wanted to be the, the next David Geffen and be an artist manager, but I learned really fast that artist management is in many respects about adult daycare. And that wasn't for me. So I wanted to be in something that I could control. And an earplug, you can control an earplug. I think the interesting entrepreneurial lesson here is you might not have understood necessarily the product or service, but you had a connection and an understanding of the potential customer. Yeah, and it's exactly. Like, there are all these different products and services. I'm going to find something to sell to somebody I'm connected with in an industry that I generally know about. Yeah, exactly. And and I was, um, I was a consumer of the product. My brother introduced me to wearing earplugs for sleep, which was extremely foreign. And he said, just try it. And when I did, I was like, oh my God, I just had the best sleep I've ever had. And what I learned in that moment was that sleeping with earplugs helps one in very much the same way as someone who may be into meditation or yoga to focus on their breath. 
That is just a byproduct. If you cover your two ear canals and just listen to yourself breathe, that's a calming experience. And that's what that product does. Getting back to the story, I had no network. I had no experience developing packages, no distribution network. I pretty much knew nothing, but what I did have was passion, drive, and a vision. That's what really carried me forward. I developed the Heroes brand, which we spell H-E-A-R, like I hear you, O-S. And I was able to secure the registered trademark for that in July of, of 1992. And with that, I just went to market. And the, one of the great things about earplugs for a startup was that there wasn't just one market segment that I could appeal to. So I was able to, on my initial sales path, sell to drugstores, grocery stores. Um, I had to work my way up to uh, earn the right to sell into big box chains, but mom and pop shops like a UPS store or sporting goods shops, music stores. My first sale was for $32.40 to a mom and pop music store called Guitar Guitar in Sherman Oaks, California. And that got me going. So I was one for one when I did that sales presentation and it worked. You know, I really could just point to milestones that we hit. Like the first big one occurred in 1996. That was four years after going to market. And I was able to land Walgreens which at the time had 1,700 stores. I'll tell you, Jordan, that I can say that very uh, quickly that, oh, I landed Walgreens. But the story behind that is kind of cool because it took seven trips to Chicago after being told six different times that, yes, Doug, we love your product and I'm going to make the recommendation that we add you to our national set. It wasn't until I met Charles Walgreen IV that he gave me a shot. And the shot was for a 20 store test that I had to pay $2,000 to the chain for the right to prove that our products were viable for their stores. And that was the beginning of, you know, that first pin to drop was huge because then we started showing up on uh, the, the industry leader IRI and data metrics were starting to be gathered for other buyers of big chains so they could objectively look at the hero's data and um, say, oh, wow, I'm seeing the hero sales have grown 174% year over year. They're doing these many units. And so I could take you through um, four years to land Walgreens, eight years Walmart, nine years Target, 12 years Rite Aid, 15 years for CVS. And Bear in mind that each one of these chains that I mentioned, it required a meeting every single year. So I went to CVS probably a dozen times before we ultimately landed the business with one SKU. So, so let's go back to, to Walgreens. Yeah. What year did you have that kind of first meeting? The first meeting occurred um, actually in 1993. You started the business in 92. So yeah. how? what were your... Monthly and or annual sales in 1993 <laughs> when you went for your first meeting with Walgreens. Oh, God. Uh, well, what I can tell you is I remember very clearly the meeting I had with my accountant. Uh, for the year, I did 52000 in sales and we lost $37,000. $37, but I can say that. So we went from 52000 in year one. Then we went to 190000 Then we went to 400000 and it just kept growing and growing and growing uh, really through from 1992 through 2008. We eclipsed at 7 million in top line sales. And the cool thing about all of these accredited sales, incremental new big box accounts that we landed was I was an outsourced model. Like talk about servicing all of these 30,000 doors, retailer doors. I did it with an assistant and I outsourced everything else. So I was doing that in a time when nobody was thinking about outsourcing. I had many people were saying, well, why don't you hire this person or hire that person? I'm like, well, I can accomplish the same thing by outsourcing that role and, and keep the company lean, mean, and profitable. That, that's the goal of the company, super profits. How well prepared were you going into Walgreens? 
or was it? <laughs> it, it again, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was just looking through my um, original sales book of what I brought to the buyer. And how, was I prepared? Yes, of course I was prepared for what I knew. What it revolved around, Jordan, was as much as I could have been prepared in order to land a chain like a Walgreens, a Walmart, a Target, the buyer has to have confidence that you can supply the chain. Because if he or she is going to allocate their precious real, real estate for the next six to nine to 12 months, they have to know that their boss isn't going to come down and say, we've got these out of stocks on this one SKU vendor called Heroes. What are you doing with this guy? And we never had that problem. In fact, in my first meeting with Walmart, where the buyer elected in that meeting to take a chance after several trips to Walmart, her final comment to me, as she looked up, I'll never forget that as well. She looked up at me and she said, now just don't miss any of my ship dates. We never did. Um, that was always for any customer. We never missed any ship date. In the business world, what I've learned is there is no A minus. A plus is the only acceptable grade. How do you balance A plus being the only acceptable grade with being a early stage business and making the mistakes that are going to come with a business that's trying to figure it out? I would say it's all, it all comes down to preparation and being ready. So when a Walgreens or, or any big box retailer when, when you're first notified that you landed your spot on their planogram, it's not something that occurs. It's not like, okay, the next day you're going to ship all 4,000 stores to our 44 distribution centers. It's okay. We're going to go through the process. So I knew in advance what was going to happen. And I also negotiated extremely favorable terms with my vendors so that I could order as much as I want and the product uh, would be delivered, and I would get paid by my customers prior to paying my vendor. So it, the ability to scale and remain as the 100% owner, the sole financier of the business throughout the company's trajectory was actually a blessing. It, it just worked out. So let's go to the kind of the other big milestones. I think we're up to around 2008 from 1982. <laughs> Let's fill in the gaps between 2008 and 2018 when you sold to an odd expat company. I remember I, I did an interview on Fox Business in 2009, and I was asked by Jenna Lee. She said, so, so tell me, how, how's the economic downturn affecting your business? And at that moment, I said, well, it really hasn't. But I didn't know of the storm that was brewing. And that storm was that the retail marketplace recognized that working with brands for what they considered commodity products was not necessarily the most profitable means for them to approach the categories. And so post the 2008, 2009 economic correction, what occurred was a shift. So we had created not only the Heroes brand, but the Sleep Pretty and Pink brand. And that was, that was a super success for us. And as a result, what happened post-2009 were the retail buyers were saying, thanks so much for telling us about what you're planning for your brand. Now we want to talk about our brand. And in doing so, what they were able to do was really maximize their profits because by selling a Walgreens or CVS brand, they're able to put those uh, categories up for auction and go with the best quality vendor at the most competitive price, and they own the traffic. So they're in control and they maximize that. So I, I actually hit a what I called a double down or die moment. And I had two choices the way I looked at it as the CEO. I could remain as a distributor of 3M earplugs. I own the brands, but the products were made by 3M for us. They make tremendously wonderfully uh, quality products, or I could go down the manufacturing road. And because I was so successful at marketing and distribution, I said, manufacturing is going to be just that easy. 
And it wasn't, Jordan. It was the most difficult path I could have chosen. And it was really built over six years. So in 2011 was when I started making the first investments. And it just was the beginning of a very difficult time for me in 2016. So I was building this manufacturing company, stops and starts, stops and starts. I was funding 3M inventory because the manufacturing was not quite where it needed to be. Um, We were getting closer and closer. I got the right uh, engineer in place in order to do it. And so in late 2016, with all of the complications of the market, my competitors, I was in competition with my retail customers in in many regards because I was a brand guy, but I pivoted to private brand. Um, I raised the white flag. And what I'll tell you in full transparency is I did it all wrong. I didn't have a book. I didn't have a roadmap for how I was going to help move this business to the next level of where it needed to go. And so what I did is, again, doing it all wrong. I learned the hard way. Um, I just started reaching out to my network, letting people know that, hey, I was looking for a partner that had the financial resources to help heroes get to that next level. And in late 2016, a friend of mine introduced me to someone who really thought it was a, a neat opportunity for his company and and move forward with me. So let's let's dive deeper into this idea of double down or die. Is it that you should have doubled down on what you were best at as opposed to going into market uh, manufacturing? Well, again, just like when I started my business, I had no experience in manufacturing. So I had utter confidence that I could tackle that mountain just as I did with marketing and distribution. In in all honesty, I got my head handed to me. (laughs) It was extremely, extremely difficult. It was just something that I thought I would learn as I I went along. And the double down or die, what was really interesting in hindsight is that one of my biggest competitors also saw, I learned years later, one of my biggest competitors went down the same path that I did to extricate themselves from being a distributor And they made some small investments into manufacturing, but they gave up. I didn't give up. And what ended up occurring was jumping all the way ahead to 2019, I was able, because of my manufacturing and because of all of the sales that I was working on getting for all those years, in 2019, we took about 70% of market share away from our biggest competitor. Because I had persevered through the manufacturing, they didn't. So you doubled down on your decision to vertically integrate Mm -hmm. manufacturing and the distribution. Were you also doing the design? Yes. Yes. So you were design, marketing, distribution, but then it's like, hey, we're going to make a big decision in 2011 to to go into manufacturing. Yes, it, it was a it was a researching process, and and bear in mind, I, I have to make one small correction for you. At the beginning of this chat, you said we're a big manufacturer of earplugs, very small, very very small in the grand scheme of of earplugs. And earplugs as a marketplace is ten billion units a year, massive. It's like toilet paper in a sense, massive consumption. But the point is that I had to find an engineer in a space that it's tribal knowledge of how to make the, these earplugs come to life. Uh, and, and all of the vendors that I'd worked with, 3M, Honeywell, the earplug manufacturing facilities were locked down, top secret, non-compete. You couldn't get within a hundred feet of the manufacturing. So here I was wanting to double down, but I had difficulty finding the guy or gal that knew how to do it and even having any idea of how it was done. So I went in blind. It it really was by the grace of God that it all worked out. (laughs) So how do you, why did you succeed with getting into manufacturing, but the competitor didn't? It was just my sheer tenacity. I would not give up on what I had set the course for. And I was going to get to that place no matter what, because also 
I wanted to grow. <laughs> I wanted to innovate. I'm about innovation. I love to do what I call delightfully disruptive products. The way I saw it, there were no innovations in the space. So, you know, I lived the American dream. I, I bet it all. And it just happened to work out. So let, let's go to 2000, what, 16, 17, 18, yeah. when now you're starting to get into M&A discussions. You know, walk us through what the situation was and your thought process in selling the business. Honestly, it was one of uh, desperation. It was veiled desperation. Um, I was in a tough spot. Company was losing money and the manufacturing was coming along, getting closer and closer to being where it needed to be, but not quite there. And I really needed support. Um, I also didn't know the first thing, just like when I started my company, I didn't know the first thing about a merger, acquisition, financing, any of that at that at that point. So as I mentioned, I just reached out to my network to let bigger companies know, and that included going to 3M, saying, hey, we've got this great brand, we've got a great relationship. Wherever I could see an angle to do a partnership, some type of acquisition, I took it. Um, and it was, it ended up being there were two parties that were interested. It's a little bit complicated. I'll, I'll do my best to explain what happened. But I met one company and the CEO and I got along terrific. He saw the opportunity, um, $250 million company, great entrepreneur, super guy. Um, but what happened with him, we actually went into an LOI and he had to call me one day and say, Doug, I'm so sorry. We really have to pump the brakes and it's not going to really work at this moment for me to acquire your business. And at that moment, things were kind of looking up for the business. The manufacturing was getting closer. I could see those cost efficiencies starting to get closer and closer. And then I met another entrepreneur, again, great guy, saw the potential with an alliance and wanted to build um, something special with me. We went into an LOI. And, the, and as we got more and more into it, I became disenchanted with how his team was executing their due diligence and their failure to respond to my attorney's requests and needs for information. And we got to such a point where it was a week before we were supposed to close we still didn't have the information. And I had a conversation with, with the entrepreneur and I said, look, I'm happy to do this deal with you if you want to do it for all cash, but I'm not going to do a partial cash, partial equity um, situation because in the back of my mind, I didn't think it would ever come together. So he elected to pass. And I also allowed that LOI with the second entrepreneur to expire. It turns out that the first acquirer uh, was now in the Audax family. He had formed a relationship with Audax. Um, his company they sold. Audax bought Pip in February of 2018, the same year mm. uh, you sold in, in November. Right. So what happened was uh, PIP aligned with Audax and uh, Audax uh, made PIP a platform company that they were going to radically grow and Heroes um, would be their first acquisition in the platform. And so um, I was able to go back to the CEO and let him know that we were available and we got back together and due diligence ensued. What are some of the most important things you wish you would have known before doing a transaction? Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for sellers out there when they are being approached by private equity firms? You know, it comes down to alignment of values, alignment of vision, and personalities, I think. You know, the Audax team, they were awesome. They were so impressive. Tremendously savvy young business people that I engaged with that were just straightforward. And I really found it so refreshing. I, I wouldn't say we had any specific challenges 
um, with that team, I would say my, what I would offer to others as they are contemplating and going into due diligence is to be mindful of full transparency. If there's any outliers or any situations that you need to communicate to the acquiring party, don't hold back, be straight up. Well, I, I think a lot of times, I mean, you have scenarios where people are like intentionally hiding the boat, the airplane, yeah. like, oh, I've, been, I've had this business for 20 <laughs> years. It's a business expense. Right. And I think you have other things that they might just not know is part of a diligence process. So I, you're hitting on a great point, which is going through that exercise and writing down either individually with your ownership group or with your team, you know, in each part of the business, the good and the bad. And using it as a brainstorming session to try to get everything out because guess what? It will come up in diligence. And if you are not prepared, you will get less money. If you don't know how to answer these diligence questions, it is a negotiation point. So it's going to come out. You might as well start to plan for it three to six months ahead of time. Absolutely. There, there's no hiding anything in, in any part of our world. And especially when it comes to an acquisition, I can tell you one one moment in time that was just awful, Jordan. And and I wrote about it in a blog, which is we were in due diligence and everything was going along perfect. And one day I got a call from our Walgreens buyer letting us know that after 22 years, the chain had made a decision to go in a different direction. They were one of our biggest customers. And I had to tell the CEO, we lost the account. And, and you know that deals are extremely fragile. And I thought, this is probably going to be the end of the acquisition. But it wasn't because the CEO uh, appreciated the transparency, uh, valued the manufacturing, the brands that I had built, and just, um, I'm a straightforward guy. There's, you know, he wanted to build a team around what I was about for the retail space. So it, it, it didn't end up killing the deal remarkably, remarkably. I love this. This is another critical point in terms of transparency is if there's something's happened that's material to the business, communicate that fast mm -hmm. to the relevant parties, even if it's imperfect information, because you want to have perfect information to have a very well-structured, well-thought-out answer to what has happened, but what we want to pick up the phone, because guess what? If you're partnering with the right company, then they, they're going to have a strategic discussion with you mm -hmm. on the same page as opposed to, oh, you're down 50% this month. Well, guess what? <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and what was fascinating is, well, first I would say it was embarrassing that I had to communicate that information because if you're CEO of an acquiring company and the other CEO that you're about to acquire is saying he lost his biggest account. How did you not know that? And it, it was true. I, I did not know because there were so many things that were happening and I can get, I can get into what occurred. But bottom line is um, what I did communicate to the CEO is I felt that that strategy that Walgreens was approaching would not necessarily play out primarily because we had a relationship with the Walgreens shopper for 22 years. So she's not just going to abandon a product that she has been loyal to for more than two decades. And as it turned out in August of 2018, I got a call from the Walgreens buyer, the new Walgreens buyer. And as, as I had uh, predicted, he, he was showing market share losses. And so he asked me to devise a strategy, which I did. And it was really fun to do it. I got back to creating fun brands in, in what we do and made the presentation. He loved it. And we landed three extremely profitable items back in Walgreens. I've advised some of my friends well in advance of any type of outreach or mindset that they may be interested to exit, get your books in order establish a data room because that's the first thing. If you can send a link, here's my data room. Wow. That's impressive. I like that. Now that it is, goes up. 
For sure. For sure. I mean, um, Audex probably spent a pretty penny on their due diligence. And, you know, in, in all aspects of business with my partners that I work with, it's all about trying to make their day a little bit easier. And the so same what, goes for an acquisition. What type of review or financial preparation should they get that they typically don't have of a business that has five or 10 million in revenue? How much is that going to cost? And what I'm getting at is like, listen, spend that 50 grand to get your books in order because it's going to make everything easier. For sure. For sure. Audited. Audited books would go a long way. And again, Jordan, uh, I didn't have audited books. My books for my manufacturing company were awful. And that was another full disclosure to the CEO. I said, look, I got to be 100% straightforward with you. It's very difficult for us to account for the cost of goods sold in this manufacturing facility. We didn't set it up right. We're not even actually sure how to do it right, which was one of the points of benefit that I was looking forward to by of being acquired because then I would learn how do the big companies do this? I, I did not know. And so he was able to then say to the Audix group, hey guys, when we go through the financials, just bear in mind, there's going to be some omissions. There's going to be some situations that it may not be as clear, just move forward. We're going to clean it up after the acquisition. And that was that really took a lot of pressure off me because I just, I, I could only share what I had and the best I, of my abilities. Let's go to this next part, which is after you partnered with private equity firm, like what was life like after you sold to a private equity firm? And what is your advice to others who are about to go through that process? Um, well, so once the, once the company was acquired, uh, in all honesty, my contact with Audax stopped. They were involved with the CEO on eight other acquisitions, and that was perfectly fine. I got to work on my business, and I didn't have to worry. So my focus after I sold was, Doug, just sell the daylights out of your earplugs. And that's what I did. <laughs> I mean, in the first year of uh, post-acquisition, I grew sales 50%, and we led the entire company in gross margin contribution. And, and that was, you know, going back to manufacturing building that we, I had been working for three years prior on a deal with Rite Aid. It, the next week after we closed with Audax, I was able to say to the CEO, you made a good bet and a good investment because we just closed a huge deal with Rite Aid. We then closed the big deal with Walgreens. There was a deal with Walmart and it just, it was just great. Life was much better because I I wasn't worried about payroll, overhead, what would be the next shoe to drop that I would have to deal with. It was all about just focused on growth. And that was that was wonderful for me. What is the the highlight of your entrepreneurial journey over 30 years? Well, obviously those those big deals were always fun, but I I, I would say that the number one most rewarding experience in the business was being able to walk into our outsourced partner, which was called New Horizons. New Horizons, uh, my company had employed 200 mentally and physically handicapped um, adults. And to be able to see these people being productive and, and really enjoying themselves assembling earplug packages, which is like so awesome. Life, life couldn't be any better. We were giving back. They were giving to us. It was just a fantastic thing. That, that for sure for me is the highlight of, of the, whole, the whole thing. There we go. All right. Well, I hope that this is episode one of multiple <laughs> that we could shoot because we can go on for hours about Probably. 30 years of building a business. <laughs> Appreciate you taking the time for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's a treat.